All right, as promised, as we look ahead to game number two in Los Angeles, I wanted to have Bob Costas on, the Hall of Famer, who's doing the games with TBS, with Ron Darling, and get into a deeper dive about the Diamondbacks. Yes, there's some things baseball-related away from just the team itself, but here's a national voice, a Hall of Fame voice, that is taking in the Diamondbacks for the first time, Bob, probably since the 2017 postseason, right? You have not, I'm sure, done Diamondback games. No, I didn't do the Diamondbacks even in 2017, but I follow baseball. I may not sure. see the Diamondbacks as often as I see some other teams, but it was certainly not a case of a couple of days before the game, who's on this team? Let me see the roster. You know, I was following it as well as I could. And obviously I watched the two games against the Brewers. What do you make out of this team from a distance now that you're sitting in the booth, but as you're coming into this series, what'd you make mm -hmm. out of them? Well, they have some talent on this team. Gabriel Moreno is going to become a well-known player. Uh, it's almost Yadier Molina-like when you look at his stats and what they are when he catches as opposed to anyone else, not just the team's record, but the staff's earned run average, all the rest. Plus, he's a good offensive player, and he hit the heck out of the ball in game one uh, into the pavilion against uh, Clayton Kershaw. But I guess everybody was hitting Clayton Kershaw in that first <laughs> inning, but that was the biggest of all those blasts. So you have Moreno. Uh, as a team, Moreno is part of it, but as a team, they might be the best defensive team in baseball. They made only 56 errors. The record is 54 by the Orioles in 2013. So that's how good they have been. Corbin Carroll is obviously the runaway rookie of the year, and he's cemented that even though the postseason doesn't count in terms of the voting for those awards. In the public mind, he's cementing that with what he's done first against the Brewers and now in the one game so far uh, against the Dodgers. Uh, there's a lot to like about this team. I've always liked Torrey Lovello. Mm. Uh, I like his whole approach. Um, talk about peaks and valleys. His first year, he's the National League Rookie of the Year. Only two years ago, they'd lose 110 games. If Mike Hazen didn't believe in him, most other managers would have been fired by then. So, you know, there's a lot to like about this team. Um, and I'm overlooking some guys. Christian Walker at first base, a gold glover with lots of power. So there's a lot to like about this team. The big question going into game one, and it wasn't even a question. The facts were so stark. Merrill Kelly was throwing batting practice against the Dodgers, whether it was at Chase Field or Dodger Stadium, but it was even worse at Dodger Stadium. And Clayton Kershaw, his postseason struggles notwithstanding, we knew about that even coming into the game, his record against the Diamondbacks, especially at Dodger Stadium, was such a contrast to Kelly uh, I'm not a gambling man, but I don't know what Vegas's line on that would have been. Not so mm. much the outcome of the game, but how many innings will Kershaw last? And what will he do? And what will Kelly do? Because Kelly had never been even minimally effective against the Dodgers before. Now, when the D-backs jump on Kershaw for six runs before Kelly even has to throw a pitch, then I think that probably eased some of the pressure and also changes the approach. Uh, you can come at hitters a little bit more. But he and the bullpen allowed the Dodgers only four hits. Now they come back with Zach Gallen against Bobby Miller. And Bobby Miller is an impressive rookie. But you have to give the Diamondbacks the edge in that one. There's a very good chance the D-backs come home needing only one more win and up 2-0. It's, uh, it's something. I was in Milwaukee, and I think there is something to momentum. And I know that you touched on this. Yeah, uh, that the postseason, the way that it is laid out, because the Diamondbacks finished the season against Houston and they weren't good. The, the three game series against the Astros, they couldn't hit anything. Mm -hmm. And they went into Milwaukee and after getting pushed around a little bit early, they found their footing, Bob. And I, I feel like they are coming in here with some momentum around them. So let's get into that. Do you feel as though that the momentum part of it where a team like the Dodgers having to sit yeah. in a momentum based uh, industry like baseball? where you don't take two, three, four, five days off, impacted game one. I'm not making excuses, and people are in Arizona will be like, Brad, come on, just give us credit. But I do mm -hmm. think there's something to it. Well, you know, that's one of the things. I'll allude to this here briefly. One of the things that all network broadcasters face, you're not giving our team <laughs> yeah. enough credit. Right. So, hey, Clayton Kershaw didn't lose the game and have the worst outing of a Hall of Fame career. The Diamondbacks just did great. And that's why I've always said, because the technology allows it, they should have local broadcasts piped into 
the local markets, and it would be an alternative, like the Manning cast in football or the K-Rod cast on Sunday Night Baseball. And the reason why local fans might want to do that or tap into that isn't necessarily because they think the network announcers suck, but either they're comfortable with hearing the same announcers they've heard, or they prefer the jubilation, the rightly jubilant response when their team does something really good. Mm. What even in otherwise intelligent people don't grasp when it comes to their team in any sport is that there is a national broadcast, and that's a different broadcast. Clayton Kershaw is a big story nationally. The Dodgers, not because of the market, but because of their success, are a big story. Their recent success, not just historical success. If the Dodgers should lose this, it's a big thing for the D-backs. They'll get plenty of credit from me and Ron Darling, just as they did in game one. But part of the story is the Dodgers winning 100 games again go out early if it happens that way. And Clayton Kershaw, who has the highest winning percentage in the history of the game for anyone with more than like 109 victories, his winning percentage now in the postseason is 500. It's terrible. His yeah. career regular season ERA is 2.48. After game one's disaster, it's now 4.49, two runs higher in the postseason. That's a national story. Also something that should be easy enough for an attentive sixth grader to grasp. <laughs> if the visiting team hits a home run, especially when it punctuates what's now at that point a five run inning, it's a murmur from the home crowd. You don't have to raise your voice as much to get over it. The broadcaster reacts to what the atmosphere is in the arena or the stadium. So, you know, people would say, I'm going on here longer than I No, it's I fine. Would, but, it's fine. But here you go. This is actually of some interest, I would think. Yeah. No network broadcaster has ever received back in the day a letter or now an email or read a tweet, which I don't advise sane people to do. But nonetheless, that went like this. Dear Mr. Michaels, Buck, Tariko, Nance, whomever, I happen to live in Tacoma and I'm a fan of the Seattle Mariners. Therefore, I had no emotional investment in the World Series between whomever. However, I found your bias in favor of Team A to be absolutely <laughs> unconscionable. Not one such communication in history. However, every one of us have received from fans hearing the exact same words. Oh, well, Bob Costas is a well-known Yankee hater. Did you know I was a well-known Yankee hater? I never Growing up on Long Island? Gave Mickey Mantle's eulogy, carried a Mickey Mantle baseball card in my pocket since I was like six, six years old, a 1958 Mickey Mantle. Now, somebody might say, oh, therefore, he roots for the Yankees. I'm a professional. Joe Buck's a professional. Joe Buck grew up in St. Louis. His dad was the voice of the Cardinals. He's done a lot of Cardinal games in the postseason. He's a professional. No matter what's in his heart, he knows how to do his job. And so people, what people infer through the prism of their own fandom is entirely different than what the bulk of the country perceives watching just hoping to enjoy the game and not projecting their own fandom or their own preference for their own local announcer on it. And they should have their local announcer. As I said, the technology allows it. Have your local announcer whom you may prefer for whatever reason. Now, what was your question, Brad? <laughs> I'm sitting here like, I'm going to get back over to this. Yeah, what was your and question? Again, the, the question, it was a great, it was, it was so well put, Bob. It, it, it was about, I'm watching, I'm in Milwaukee. I'm yeah. watching the Diamondbacks just go right oh. through the Brewers. And the whole idea of days off yeah. and the momentum of baseball, where do you fall in like the way the postseason calendar yeah. rolls? And was it unfair as Dodger fans are claiming today, that they had to sit and wait and the momentum just yeah. wasn't there. Yeah, that's why I took a little detour about I'm network right. announcers and uh, foolishly perceived bias. Because what I'm about to say is independent of the teams involved or the outcome of any series. Baseball is different from other sports. The best team is gonna lose roughly speaking, 60 games and win 100. And the worst team's going to win, unless you're the Oakland A's or the Royals or something, is basically going to win 60 to 70 and lose the rest. So the margins are smaller. And the margins don't always play out in a short series. Now, is a best of seven definitive? No. 
but it's a fairer test. Mm -hmm. Think of what the division series is. Not only is it best of five, but if this series goes five, there will be three off days. Therefore, and it doesn't matter whether this exactly applies to the Diamondbacks more than the Dodgers or vice versa, because we're talking about the general idea, not the specific teams. You could get through that series with just two effective pitchers and maybe a bullpen game in the middle game or your third starter for three or four innings or whatever it might be. Even, let, me jump in, let me jump in here, Bob. Even, yeah. even in game one, I'm sitting there thinking, does Torrey even consider pulling Merrill on his pitch count? Because this game is so out of control that he may not have to use Fott. He may not have to. Now, that may be crazy thinking, but to your point, because the way that the off days are set yeah. up, yes, continue. I think it's more likely that he pulled him because he wants him to be fully rested for a likely game four start sure. yes. because the off days allow him to start game four on four days rest. And if there's a game five, then Zach Gallen could start for the second time in the series also on four days rest. So I think we're talking about the format here. The regular season, the postseason format should appropriately advantage the teams that have done better in the regular season and somewhat disadvantage those who did less well and came in through the side door. And what I think they should do, no division winner should be thrown in with the wild cards. If you're going to have divisions, it has to mean something to win it. And here's what I think they should do. And it's a nod toward your concern, and it's a legitimate one in baseball, which is no matter how good you are, you don't want to sit around too long. The other team picks up momentum. So what I think they should do is have the fifth and sixth qualifiers, the second and third wild cards, play each other on the second wild card's home field in a one-game knockout like it used to be only until only a couple of years ago, and fans seem to like that. And then the winner of that goes to the home field of the best wild card, which in some seasons is the second-best team in the league, like the Dodgers were a couple of years ago when they won 106 and the Giants won 107. And then the winner of that game becomes the fourth team in the division series. And then you reseed after that, yeah. because then the best team should probably play the third best division winner if the wild card is a better team than that. And you make the division series, like the LCS and the World Series, best of seven. It's a truer test. Now, you wouldn't be burning too much time with that wild card format. You wouldn't have teams sitting around as long. Because even though all the wild card series this year were sweeps, you still had the off days built in. Right. So that didn't help any. You didn't start any sooner because they were sweeps. So you get the wild card part over quickly, and you'd make the next series a best of seven, a truer test that would not make it anything close to impossible for an upset or a certainty that the higher seeded teams would win. But it makes more sense to do it that way. Having said that, that's not a pro-Dodger or anti-Diamondback no. thing. We're talking about Team A and Team B theoretically. It's like when I said years ago that the NFL's overtime rule made no sense, especially in the postseason. And I did it on NBC right after the Patriots had that comeback against the Falcons. And some people said, well, the Falcons blew the game with, with stupid strategy. Yes, they did. And I stipulated that. Or, hey, the Patriots had a great comeback. Why, do you hate the Patriots? No, this is theoretical. <laughs> the rule makes no sense. They've improved it a little in that you have to have uh, a possession, even if it's a touchdown on the first possession in the postseason. But they should, in the postseason, play a time period. And in the regular season, they still have the rule that if you score a touchdown on the first possession, the game is over. In the regular season, they should at least have one possession per team, and then you play sudden death after that. It's pretty simple to understand. And when people respond to that by saying, hey, if you can't stop a punt return for a touchdown, or hey, if you screw up all your timeouts, can't you think in the abstract rather than the particular? Can't you think beyond your own team and to kind of a general idea? Yeah. That's what I'm laying out here. Class dismissed. No, it's. Uh, I was thinking of that the other night. 
I loved how you worked in Hee Haw with Tori Lovello because yeah. it's just got to be something talked about for the, and it's not really talked about much. There's well, that's what story. you do when the score's 11 to nothing. Yes, yes. I know you're folding back to page 30 of notes, but that's correct. That's show prep. Um, is there something about a storyline about this team? You know, you mentioned off the top about Moreno. I think Moreno and Gary L go look back at the deal they made with the Blue Jays. And then go look at the Goldschmidt deal that brought Carson Kelly here, who did absolutely mm-hmm. nothing, and they had nothing to show for it. And the fans wanted Hazen gone. They wanted Tory gone. I mean, the, the way that it's been built, Bob, and giving Corbin Carroll a 10-year contract before the season started, fans are like, why are we doing this? Like, Mike Hazen has hit on a lot of things, and we know about the personal side of what he went through. So are there some storylines you want to go a little deeper on around the team before I get yes. to Yes, the Mike Hazen storyline – not only the way this team was built uh, and the Corbin Carroll deal harkens back to like what the uh, then Cleveland Indians did in the nineties, trying to get all their good young players under contract for a stretch of time. So like they could have a run. They never won a world series, but they had a number of deep runs into the postseason with very good teams using that strategy. Um, So you could say that Corbin Carroll might, if he had waited, make more than that on an annual basis. But he went for the security of the deal, and it's not exactly like it's a pauper's deal, so it works for for both sides. When it comes to the storyline of Mike Hazen, I actually told the producers, let's wait to tell that story of Mike and Nicole and his four boys. Let's wait to tell that story until we're at Chase Field. Mm. Let's tell that story in game three because it plays out in an environment where you can take the appropriate visuals that, that kind of back it up. But then let's also show a graphic about how Hazen built the team. Um, and I think as the Diamondbacks, especially if they win game two and they're on the verge of wrapping up the series, then the whole storyline shifts a little bit. The storyline in game one, if you look at it objectively, was weighted toward Kershaw and the Dodgers, but appropriately so. But then when the Diamondbacks grabbed the game by the throat, then some of that, even within that broadcast, tilted back toward the Diamondbacks. Before I get you out of here, um, you mentioned the stadium. And over here, we've seen this year uh, what's gone on in Tampa with their stadium Mm -hmm. in front of family and friends. We've seen Milwaukee. I was just there, and they were talking about them wanting the stadium. Here in Arizona, Ken Kendrick and Derek Hall have talked about they're going to address the stadium at the end of the year. And it's been pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. Bob, where are you at on on stadiums being built and public-private and wanting new ballparks? You're in all these stadiums. I don't know the last time you were at Chase Field, but what do you make out of here in Arizona, I guess? Well, you know what? It seems now that the shelf life of a ballpark is like a quarter of a century. Mm Mm-hmm. New ballpark in Texas, what, in 1994 or something like that? And then they had to build another one. That one was outdated and Globe Life came along. Miller Park, as it was then called, opened, I think, in 2001. And now the Brewers say they need a new ballpark. It's the smallest market um, in the majors, uh, but they seem to do pretty well. Their fans seem to like that ballpark. I think the Rays situation is different. Not only is that stadium just terrible for baseball, no matter how you look at it, but the location is also bad. People have to come across that bridge um, at a certain time of the day, and there are often thunderstorms in Florida at that time of the day. It's just various things that keep fans away. Plus, you've got a lot of relocated people who aren't natural Rays fans. You know, people in Clearwater with a Phillies train, they're rooting for the Phillies or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, because all those spring training sites are, are clustered there. So they face a different kind of challenge. Uh, if they hadn't gotten the new ballpark on the drawing board, I think they probably would have had to have moved yeah. someplace else. But the general idea about that I feel about a new ballpark, in one way or another, there's always some sort of public assistance, even for the wealthy team owners, that, whether it's infrastructure improvements, tax rate breaks, bond issues, whatever it might be, there's some, and even if the uh, the team uh, assumes the bulk of it, like they did in San Francisco, for mm-hmm. example, with that beautiful ballpark, there's always something that the taxpayers contribute or some sort of nod in that direction. 
And so what I would hope would happen is that there'd be a provision anytime there's a new ballpark, a certain amount of these seats must be set aside at X or less. Even as you've got your luxury suites and even as you're you're charging what used to be World Series type uh, prices for regular season games, there's got to be somewhere up in the grandstand, five dollar seats, ten dollar seats, whatever it is that they that they decide upon so that the average guy and girl can come to the ballpark because they're fans of the team as well. And, you know, following the team on television now sometimes involves some kind of payment, yep. some kind of cable situation. Or now this one's over here on Amazon. This game is on Apple or whatever it might be. I think baseball needs to worry about eventually alienating some of what are actually their most rabid and consistent fans who just can't afford to follow the team in the same way that they used to. Yeah, no, I think it's fair here in Arizona because we have so many people that are coming in and on Wednesday night, it'll be the first time in six years that we've had postseason baseball and and the market is alive. We are one of the busiest sports markets in America that people yeah. don't really talk about. There's always something going on here. And for the baseball team, I'm very pleased having seen them from day one with Jerry Colangelo to where they are now to, to actually be performing well. And I appreciate your time and insights. As always, Bob, I'll see you at the ballpark. Good luck editing this, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Zero editing. Zero. We're going to put really? it out there. Oh, yeah. We, well, this is, this well, is, uh, there'll be some TV segments, Bob. You know how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in the world of podcasts, in the world of web TV, yeah. uh, there's all sorts of different ways. So, no, you, I you, appreciate you, it. I appreciate you see, it. you know, as a broadcaster, if I'm doing a studio show and they say 25 seconds, I can make a point in 24 seconds. But when it's open ended and we're just sitting here like this, the podcast or whatever, you know, that's the way it goes. By the way, for those who may wonder, this is the backdrop for my home studio. It's Studio 24-7 for awesome. the Major League Baseball Network with Willie Mays and, and Mickey Mantle. You know, they have Studio 42 for Jackie Robinson and 21 for Clemente and three for Babe Ruth. Yep. So I said, why don't we do 24-7? That was awesome. during COVID, and it's, it's still helping me out. You know, being able to do stuff from home. It gets you through. I t I'll, t I'll leave you with this. I tell the Bob Costa story that I'm on the air at KTAR. I come here from being on Mighty 690 in Southern California. I'm the yeah. new guy and this and that. And I have Bob on to do one of his books. He's out here doing the Suns and, uh, and during the Barkley era. And he shows me a tie and I've got the book. And he's like, which tie do you think? And then I said, can you come <laughs> on the show? And you're talking about your book. Bob calls me the day after the interview. This was back in the late 90s. And he said, hey, I just want to apologize. I talked too much last night. What? You're great. It was really nice of you. You didn't talk too much. I like to just let you go. Well, well now taking that cue yes. 20 years later, 20 plus years later. 20 plus years later. And I still haven't edited myself, but there you go. <laughs> see you later. Appreciate your time as always, Bob. Thanks. All right, Brad. Good to see you as always. See you There's the Hall of Famer Bob Costas doing the game on TBS. Make sure you watch them with uh, Ron Darling doing the games on TBS with the Diamondbacks. We're back with more after this timeout.